Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lure, and I'm thrilled to have uh, another gentleman with the same name on the other line here, Dr. Marcus Elliott, calling from Santa Barbara in California. Welcome to the podcast, doctor. Thank you, Marcus. It's a pleasure to join you. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm very excited over this, uh, over our conversation here. Uh, I've done a bit of homework, um, and not just on, of course, who you are, but on really on, on what you're doing. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to get into this. But before we get there, let me make sure that our listeners also have a little better appreciation of who you are and, and, and what you've done so far, and, and then you can take it from there. Um, so Dr. Elliot um, has his doctor degree from the Harvard Medical School, so right up there, um, and, uh, and also recently was awarded the Harvard Medical School Special Medical Award, um, Sports Medical Award, I believe. Um, so, uh, and, but the, in terms of the, your, your role, and, and from what I at least can see how you got into the world of sports, um, was uh, with the New England Patriots um, at that time. Uh, very focused on the injury prevention side of it. Um, and you spent a few years also with the Seattle Mariners, so um, in a different sport, the MLB. Um, and I believe at that time you were one of the first directors of sports science and performance. Uh, and I think that's, from the looks of it, <clears throat> also is really where, where you are now um, in many ways. Uh, I understand you're working with now also very heavily with the NBA and, and, and quite a few players there. Um, you sit on a few advisory boards, but um, where we are going to spend a lot of time on really is on your own company, uh, P3 Analytics and P3 Applied Sports Science. So you're a doctor turned entrepreneur, and of course, this is the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast, so I think there is a, is a beautiful theme right there. Um, yeah, it's but, funny, Marcus. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, uh, sorry to cut you off, but um, in both the NFL and Major League Baseball, um, I was I was the first director of, uh, of sports science. Right. And... Uh, and you know there really wasn't uh, people weren't using this analytical approach to understanding athletes and and doing injury modeling and performance modeling and essentially predicting the future using good data until we started engaging in it. Yeah. So tell, tell us a bit more about it. How you got into it? Um, was that already your focus when you were studying it? Um, I believe you have a you know your 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 degree is in in, in sports science, so clearly that was your focus. Um, but how do you get from there then into the next job? Or or tell us a bit about it. You know, when uh, this is this is always strange when I tell people this, and it, it's it's funny. I just I actually just got I got uh, uh, IM by a handful of uh, classmates over this last week from this Harvard award that I got, and mm -hmm. a lot of times what they say is that uh, you told me exactly what you were going to do 25 years ago, wow. and you've uh, you've self actualized. So I, for some I reason, it. I had this idea. I had this idea in my head, Marcus, that mm. I was going to I was going to study the human body really hard. Right. And apply it in elite sport. From when I was really young, when I was mm -hmm. still in high school, I had this idea, and there, there really wasn't a career track for it. And so I just, I just started making it up. And you know, I studied physiology and I studied biomechanics, uh, but I also, at a really young age, started working with elite athletes. Started working at the Olympic Training Center when I was 18, mm -hmm. and uh, and went through swimmers and and short track speed skaters and sprinters and all types of sports. And essentially, right. what I would do is go into sports that I knew nothing about and approach it as a physiologic biomechanical event and think about the systems that are involved and ways to measure those systems and, and ways to um, then optimize those systems. Right. And that's really what I do still. Yeah, um, and, I love that. And, you know, the, the hardest part of it has been the fact that that's, that wasn't there really wasn't a career track for it. There wasn't anybody doing anything like this. Yeah. And so the hardest part isn't hasn't been the execution. It's not actually doing the work. It's not. It's not creating value. It's, it's um, creating a space that didn't exist. Yeah. Um, convincing people that they should have more data on their athletes, and that um, and that they should be doing more to, to model performance before they invest in contracts and things like this. It, it seems normal and, and 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 obvious now, but clearly 20 years ago, when data and and, and the analytics side of it wasn't there, um, it it didn't appear that obvious. And I think that's what you're talking about, right? When you started, really, um, this wasn't um, so obvious. Uh, talk, talk a bit about your days at, at with uh, with the Patriots. Um, you, know, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of fans out here. Uh, what is it really? How does it? You know, how, what is it? You know, you see the doctor when when a, when a player gets injured, but otherwise, of course, uh, yeah. it's really the doctors behind the scene. Um, yeah. You know, how do you work with them? Yeah, let me just just to frame this from a high view, because people that are sports fans or 
even people that are that work in and around sport, like uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners um, probably don't understand this, but mm. somehow when the business of sport got really big, um, the business of caring for these athletes, uh, the business of optimizing those athletes, reducing injuries, yeah. um, really the business of optimizing investment in the athletes got left behind. Somehow it didn't track along with the business of sport. Okay. And so... In, you know, in the 1970s, a professional athlete would have a part-time job. Almost all right. of them worked in the off-season. Right. Um, and now they make $20 million a year. And, um, and yet the care of those athletes hadn't changed a whole lot. Mm-hmm. I know it's hard to believe, but it's, yeah. it's, right now it's changing a lot. Over the last half decade, even decade, but especially the last half decade, things are changing really quick. Mm-hmm. But uh, when we started this, like with the Patriots, when I, when I engaged with the Patriots, that was in 99 and 2000. Yep. And at that, at that time, um, the, their NFL team had two training programs. They did, had two different approaches to, to building their athletes and preventing injuries in their athletes. They had, a, they had a program for their speed athletes, which were wide receivers and defensive backs and you know, tend to be the smaller, quicker athletes. Yeah. And, they had, and then they had a program for their strength athletes. Yeah. And that was Big it. Guys. Right. Okay. That was it. So there was there's one of two different programs, and and the reality, um, and I think a lot of people can appreciate this now, but the reality is you can have two 350 pound players that play the same position or the same age, and their needs can be exactly the opposite. Yeah. You know, you can have one guy that has amazing lower body power, but he has really lim- big limitations in hip mobility and can't put himself in positions where he can use that power, yeah. and you have another athlete who has amazing hip mobility but has no strength or power in his legs so it doesn't matter that he can create these positions or angles Mm. um, because he just doesn't have enough juice and the approach to those two athletes is completely different and that's that's a really crude example but the reality is all all these athletes are different just like we're all different and uh, because their their bodies are valued so much there should be a lot more care and scrutiny and precision placed around developing these athletes and preventing injuries in the athletes and that was really the model that we that we brought to the table, yeah. and uh, and with the Patriots, um, you know, I can tell you the the program worked out super well. Essentially, we were, we were tasked with reducing muscle injuries, mm-hmm. and so we, we came into this environment where you were in, on one of two different training programs, and instead, uh, when we entered the picture, you would be assessed within two and a half weeks of the season ending, and you'd be put on an individualized program based on needs that were. That were ascertained from all the testing, mm. um, and it was all it was all designed to decrease injury and and uh, and increase performance. And so through the off season, before these guys are playing games that actually mean something, they're working on um, on fixing compensations. They're working on um, on becoming more symmetric. Uh, they're working on mechanics based on objective data that we pulled from them. Right. And yeah. uh, and Very we, interesting. And and I can tell you, and you know, there's that we've done this so many different times with so many different teams, and in every environment it works. Sometimes it works really, really well, and sometimes it works pretty well. But in that in that case, we went from having a mean of uh, it was primarily designed to reduce muscle injuries, and we went from a mean of 21 and a half uh, hamstring strains a year that were treated by our staff to three in the first year that our program was in place, and then the next year two. And won a Super Bowl, and then won another Super Bowl, mm. um, and you know, by by any metric, it was wildly successful. And That's we awesome. were probably we were probably a little bit lucky, but we also just did a lot of things that made sense. Yep. You know, we worked on fixing a lot of things that that we know put athletes at risk. Yeah. So, did you you get a ring too? Is that how that works uh, as a doctor? Yeah, it's good. That's good, right? Yeah, that's, that's a nice awesome. Bonus. I love that. Um, now, uh, before we move on, uh, I, I want to stick a minute, just a minute on, on the NFL. Being such a high impact sport, um, clearly injuries is, is just, I guess, part of the game, um, especially now with head injuries and, and over the last several years of becoming, you know, very prominent uh, or, or a topic. Um, did you work in that space a bit as well, or your focus was more on, on other par- body parts in a sense? Yeah. You know, head injuries were something that players were aware of. Um, but not like wildly aware of it's right. uh, that really that came after that time, so right. that that really was that wasn't a focus of ours at all. It was, uh, and I, I would still say, look, if you're an NFL player, uh, um, repetitive head injuries are a real thing. Almost anybody that's been around uh, hockey and and football can tell you that there there is yes. a syndrome. There's a, a constellation yep. of of, uh, of symptoms that you see in some people that have played the game for a long time. Yes, um, and so it's a it's a real thing. I mean, it really, it's a real thing. 
But uh, as a player, uh, in the heat of the battle, these guys are generally more concerned with, with having a system that can compete, you know, with a system that allows them to support their families and, and, um, and as I said, compete. And, um, and, and I'd, I'd say that's still the case. You know, there's a big, there's a, head injuries are, are a concern for NFL players. And there's guys that are foregoing careers based on fear of head injuries. But most of these guys just want to be able to outcompete the guy on the, on the other side of the line. <laughs> yes. You know, that's, and that's a beauty of sport, right? Is that you both know what the objective is and you prepare as you will. Um, you know what the rules of the game are, yeah. and then you go, and then you go, Absolutely. and you see who you, you see who wins that day. And that's, there's something that's so beautiful about that. It's such a it's such a pristine competitive environment, and that's that's really what's what's kept me in the sport. When I, at times, you know, as I was I was going through my educational track, there were lots of other options I could have I could have followed. And, and and frankly, most people in my educational track thought it was a, a waste of a world class education to go and. Wow. Be this overqualified, overqualified personal trainer. Um, <laughs> um, but, Interesting. But okay. I, I, I would always fall back on that: is that that it's such a that sport, as it, at its essence, is just this beautiful um, uh, meritocracy. Yes. You know, there's something so there's so something so pure about it, and and that's still the case. You know, I've been this is all I've ever done in my life, and and it's still it's still the case. I still I, I love steam. Um, uh, competitive meritocracy of, of elite sport, where you, these athletes give this, give everything they have to this endeavor, and compete with every cell in their body, yeah. and uh, yeah. you don't really find that, you don't find that often in in life, huh? That is true. That's true. And let's hope we can get them back on the field soon again. But we'll, we'll talk a bit about that later. Um, now, then you moved from, you know, and not necessarily that it was in an immediate. Uh, there was, you know, quite a few years in between. But uh, eventually, you you did go, of course, into the MLB, uh, which is a very different sport, um, different impact. Um, you know, what, what what do you see? What what or what made that happen? And uh, and and uh, you know, what what was some of the stories for, was uh, with the Mariners, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, we worked with, even when we were designing these programs for the Patriots and I still was, I was involved in lots of other sports. Right. Um, and I, I like solving problems. Mm -hmm. And so it would have been easy just to stay in the NFL. You know, I think, uh, given the success of our program there and right. the success of the Patriots too, it would have been easy just to build a career in, uh, in the NFL, but it's, it's fun. I really enjoy solving problems. And so I want to think about rotational mechanics and arm injuries and the essentially the physical systems mm. that drive success as a baseball player. And so we developed the analytical models around measuring those physical systems and training those physical systems and, right. and then put them into play. You know, we trained a lot of the better athletes in, in Major League Baseball and uh, took over an organization. Um, I can tell you uh, from, from firsthand experience, the, uh, the sports uh, that have the highest skill component are the ones where there's usually the most slack in athlete development. Uh -huh. So the, the sports that have the highest skill component can essentially afford to have the most uh, slack in physical development. So a sport like football, one of the reasons I engaged in football first is it was it was the closest thing to our Olympic sprinters that I'd worked with. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a sport where, where two athletes line up across from each other and they have these gladiator exchanges and the most powerful, the quickest, the best system tends to win those exchanges. Right. And so if you build if you build a better system, you tend to win. And if you have uh, lots of gladiators winning, then you tend to win games. Um, whereas in baseball or uh, basketball or in European football, um, in those, the skill component is so high that you can have better athletes uh, that are less skilled and less successful. Right. Right. Yeah, it adds another, yeah, that is another question I, I have uh, and I want to get a bit into. Um, now, but, but before we go a bit deeper now, um, the word applied sports science, obviously, that's it's all over your CV. Uh, and to me, that sounds like it's sort of the overarching um, scheme here. Uh, maybe uh, could you just explain it a bit more? I, I Googled it, so I understand a little more now. But uh, you know, maybe if you, in your words, what is applied sports science and why should, um, as an athlete and, of course, organization, be uh, very, very interested in this? Well, again, yeah, I'd say getting back to my thought about going into elite sport and pro sport, um, these, are, these are giant businesses. And optimizing the players who play in those businesses um, can have significant effects on outcomes. And uh, and there was a lot of slack in that piece. The development of these athletes, the injury prevention, 
the analytical models around the athletes so that you can you can get smarter even when you have bad outcomes. All of these all of these things. So there's there's lots of slack in the in the athlete development optimization space. So that was that was really the driver for me to right. push in elite sport and applied sports science. Um, I, you know, we've, we've used this um, ubiquitously in, in our facility for a while. Um, it wasn't something that you heard much about. In fact, mm-hmm. you know, 10 years ago, I couldn't tell people that I worked in applied sports science because it wasn't a thing. Nobody knew what that was. Correct. Yeah, was, was, yeah absolutely. Um, and really, the, I think the important part is the, is the applied piece. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've said this forever that there are, you know, there's smart people that work in labs, and we we have some we have some partnerships in academics and academic medicine, and there's smart people that work in those spaces, oftentimes doing smart things, um, and then there's sport, and what happens in sport, and what happens in these in these physiology or biomechanics labs or other sports science type labs, are completely different things. Mm. There's usually no crosstalk. Right. So and so it doesn't really matter if you're uncovering some interesting biomechanics and you're in your biomechanics lab, it doesn't matter to somebody in, let's say, uh, world soccer, if it's not being applied. If right. the uh, the performance coaches or people around your organization aren't able to take that information and put it to work. And so my interest was in having one foot clearly in science, clearly in, in academics, and then one foot firmly where the athlete lives, one foot on the field with the athlete. Right. Um, and, it's, and it's a difficult thing to do. It's hard to straddle those two worlds. They're very, very, very different worlds. Mm. You know, all the, the the value systems, the the timelines. It's they're very different worlds, different different such different cultures, different languages, all of it. But um, but that's the high value is to um, legitimately be able to do both those. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 what Google throws out, it says the study of the human response to sports, and then it has sort of four elements: physiology, biomechanics psychology and skill uh, acquisition, I think is what they call it. Which is the part you are mostly focused on, or is it really the whole, uh, all, all three or four of them? You know, when we started, our task, our call was to use any technology that would give us insight into um, into the athlete that was in front of us that we were trying to optimize. Mm. So any technology from biomechanics labs, from medical labs, any, tech, any technology was open game. And then and Marcus, in the beginning, we used lots of technology. We were doing lots of things. We were trying lots of things. Some of them were stupid, you know, the kind of ridiculous when I look back now. Right. Um, but over this last decade, especially, what we've really honed in on is uh, the study of movement. Right. They were by far the most valuable thing. And we were, look, we were measuring uh, EMG, like measuring during uh, muscle activation, muscle contraction. We were measuring EEG, looking at brain waves and performance mm-hmm. environments. Right. We were using lots of inertial sensors. We were doing all kinds of things. And by far, the most valuable thing we were doing is actually studying athlete movement. Right. Um, studying how these systems work when athletes are driving them hard. How do they cut? How do they land? How do they jump? Mm-hmm. How do they, how do they uh, in a reactive environment, change direction? And doing it in a super granular way. And what, and what we found is that, and, and, and I would say this is if you're going to take one thing from this this podcast, uh, remember this, how we move has profound consequences for the good and bad things that happen to our bodies. Mm -hmm. So measuring a body now gives us a whole lot of insight into where it's going to wear out, parts that might break acutely, traumatically, um, and and also it gives us an understanding of competitive advantages. So setting movement um, gives us insight into into what's going to happen to these systems uh, before it happens in a, in a really predictable and generally pretty granular way. Right. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, now, and that leads nicely into the, my next question, really, uh, what you call movement data or granular data. Uh, and I read a bit about it, how you capture it. And maybe talk us through that because it's clearly not, you're just not having things on bodies anymore, right? But there are machines now which can do this with, without uh, sticking a bunch of things on folks, right? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of different ways to measure mechanics, and we use we use a bunch of different tools. But um, a lot of the the most valuable tools that we use are still it's a traditional uh, motion capture assessment, mm-hmm. where oftentimes we use reflective markers. We don't have to, but a lot of the most valuable data we collect are these is this reliable data we can collect in a in a motion capture environment. So, for instance, for our in in, in the NBA. Um, 
you know, we started with a couple of NBA athletes and they had nice success. And, and then mm -hmm. we had a few more and a few more and then a, a team or two. And now, um, as of this, this season, that's temporarily on hold, uh, the 2020 season, we have uh, almost 60%. Uh, we have 58.5% of the current NBA athletes that have been through one of our facilities. Right. And so we've assessed, um, you know, pushing towards 60% of the current NBA players. Amazing. And what we'll do with them is we'll put them in a lab environment and we'll have them try to jump high and slide fast and change directions and put them in these performance environments where they're just trying to be athletes. Mm. They're trying to move uh, like they do when they play the game. And we're timing all those things. So they're pressure, uh, they're time pressured. And, uh, and they also know that we've assessed all the best players in the game. Um, and so these, you know, they're competitive that by, by nature, yep. they're competing, uh, they're, they're competing even on our lab environment against the, their best players at their position. Right. And, and when we get done, we, we have a real great insight into how their physical systems work. Um, but most importantly, um, how they execute these movements, you know, what systems they use to decelerate, mm. how much force is going through their knees versus their hips versus their ankles. Is there rotation across long bones? We have this amazingly detailed view of how their their mechanical system works, how the Newtonian forces of a human being are being manifest in these athletes when they're driving their bodies really hard. And from these big data sets now, we do these correlation studies where we can look at any injury that you're interested in, um, any performance variable, and we can see the Newtonian physics behind uh, risk or b behind performance environments and more and more we can we can predict either risk or performance advantages in players even before they get to the league yeah yeah interesting and it, it's all it's really marcus it and and when people come in it looks so it looks super complex and you know and and, uh, and incredibly sophisticated but but in truth it's a uh, it's uh, it's Newtonian physics. It's high school physics being applied over and over and over. Right. Uh, it's just, it just really hasn't been done before. Yeah. You know, these big data sets have never existed. Yeah, yeah. I read I read the the story about uh, James Harden um, and what uh, some I think one article they call him the superhuman decelerator. Uh, because he can stop quicker than others, I guess. So, uh, you know, talk of you know, use them maybe as an example because I know you you work with a couple of those uh, NBA players, and uh, you know, maybe just again, just one real example of, of you know what that means, and and yes. also maybe for the athlete now knowing it, um, you know, because the mind is a big part as well, right? and I'll get to that later. Uh, you know, once he believes he is superhuman in some sense, I guess it probably <laughs> makes his game better again, right? Yeah, well, you know, so James is a really interesting um, example for us and for, for a few reasons. I think, I think first off, you have to understand that traditionally people thought of his athlete, thought of athleticism as uh, do you run fast uh, and do you jump high, mm -hmm. and and those are those are two characteristics that are the most visible to the naked eye. Yeah. You know, it's easy to see that that guy jumps higher than that guy, and he, yes. and he you know he got that rebound because he jumps so high, yeah. uh, or that that guy runs away from those guys. And so those are those are the most obvious forms of athleticism, but they're these these second order performance metrics. Uh, we think of these more hidden performance metrics that are going to be as or more compelling than the ones that are obvious to the eye. Mm -hmm. And we've uh, we've identified a lot, and they're they're unique in each sport. Mm -hmm. And so the one you're talking about with uh, with James Harden um, is his breaking ability. Um, and uh, I can tell you when we when we assessed James, we got done assessing him, and um, and I, I don't think he'd mind sharing this. And, and I think some of it's, some of it's out in, out in the literature too. But uh, when we got done assessing him, um, all of his physical metrics were about average or a little below average. Okay, okay. all of his traditional metrics, right at average or slightly below average, hmm. 48th percentile, 50th percentile, 49th percentile, 51st percentile. And Amazing. You mean average to the average NBA player, not to the average human. <laughs> yeah. Okay. To the average NBA player, which <laughs> okay. is which is amazing already, just so you Correct. know. Okay. Correct. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. So he's very he's a very average uh, performer with re with regard to all these traditional performance metrics. Mm. But when we look out at this sea of of average data, um, we see these random spikes, these giant spikes that are 99th percentile, 100th percentile, 99th percentile. And all of those spikes, those 100 percentile spikes, were related to his breaking ability. They're all 
mechanics around breaking, the ability to handle giant stretch loads across tendons and muscles. Um, and those are, that's not something that's normally identified as a, as a performance metric. And so we, we put together these big algorithms that, that describe those braking systems. And so um, James was, first off, he was the best breaker that we'd, we'd ever assessed, better than any, any player we'd assess from uh, Premier League in soccer, from NBA, or NBA database of 800 NBA players, um, the, best, the best breaker we'd ever assessed. Um, but when you do that, um, you can also, when you start identifying these, these secondary performance metrics, um, you can use them in scouting um, and you can use them in training. Um, and so uh, a year or two later, uh, we started assessing, this probably a year later after, we, after the first assessment of James, we started assessing this, uh, this young player from, uh, from Europe that was coming over, a 15-year-old that would come and train with us in the summers. And uh, he did really well playing in the EuroLeague. And um, and then two years ago, all the teams are trying. He decided he wants to come into the NBA, and these are giant decisions. Uh, mm. These draft decisions are giant decisions. They can be at the top of the draft. Those are those yeah. are hundred million dollar decisions. You know, yes. they change organization outcomes, and um, and there was lots of discussion over whether this young player from Sylvania, who happened to be um, a little bit a little bit overweight, looked kind of doughy, you know, and. He, He's a he's a he's a white kid from Sylvania who looks a little bit a little bit pudgy, um, and everyone's uh, doubting whether or not he has enough athleticism to play in the NBA. Right. And we've got four years of data on this young kid coming in the NBA wow. that says that he is already breaking at the 95th percentile for NBA players. He is almost James Harden like in his ability to stop. Okay. And there is no way that you can, as an 18 year old, can be better than 19 out of 20 NBA players. At a really important physical metric, mm. and not be successful. Right. And so we knew this kid was going to do super well, and I you know, and, and and you know, we shared that with uh, people that that he wanted us to share that with, and and he uh, his name uh, is Luka Doncic, Correct. and uh, and he came into, yeah, he came in with the Dallas Mavericks, and he had his rookie year was was uh, was a legendary year. It was a. Uh, it was a historic year, and his second year, he's one of the best players in the league. You know, as a as a twenty year old, yeah. Um, and and it speaks to, you know, it's I guess the the type of data we're collecting starts to illuminate things that we've traditionally said in sport. You just can't teach. Mm. You know, you can't teach that. It looks like instincts. It looks like, you know. And listen, there are lots of things we can't measure. Let's not let's not pretend we can measure all these things. Yeah. But there's Newtonian physics behind sport that hadn't been illuminated. To, that starts to tell a lot of these stories. That starts to uh, make, like I said, build, that allows us to make predictions that are consistently um, in the ballpark, and uh, and that 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 data hadn't existed. You know, right. again, it's the kind of thing that people had always said. Well, you, you can't teach that. He just has an amazing instinct for the game, and uh, and they, they would they would say that about James, about James. They'd say it about Luca, and and um, and so we've started putting those type of metrics on the map. Very and, interesting. Uh, but, and by, and by the way, in, in the sport, I think you have interest in uh, in soccer, uh, and, and and I'm just assuming that because uh, because you're German, but uh, <laughs> I do. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. But uh, but I, I think this breaking metric is going to be as or even more important in in, uh, in soccer and world soccer yes. than it is in the in the NBA because it allows you to create space. You yeah. know, if you can stop better than everybody else you automatically have space and from the space you, you're allowed to make decisions and you create time yeah. and um and so uh so we're very interested in that that specific metric in in uh in soccer but that's really we do those that's our process over and over is is uh illuminating these systems that, are, that create advantages uh and then at the same time taking all this granular data and we have you know on each of these these athletes we have we have running um, we have thousands of data points, usually year to year to year on running years, right. and so um, um, we just completed this this uh, this knee injury study. Um, nobody's been able to do these things, but we can go in and take a sample of 600 NBA players and use machine learning to design an algorithm that tells mm -hmm. us what variables are most um, strongly predictive of knee injury, which ones correlate strongest with knee injury, and then the machine, a computer, can tell us. Uh, how those variables are related to each other. Wow. Just how they're related to an injury, for instance, like this acute knee injury, traumatic knee injuries, um, um, but also how they're related to each other. And then 
And then we designed an algorithm for that. And uh, one of the one of the more exciting things to come out of our shop over the last couple of years is we just tested that algorithm for the last five years in the MBA. And and we had an area under the curve of 0.7, which means that if we assessed the player in the off season and we said he was at high risk for a knee injury, there was a 70% chance that in the very okay. next season that player had a knee injury. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean that that is amazing data. I mean because I, I you know I I relate this to you know if you take an F1 car or any any other high performance mechanical device right um, that needs you know tooling and that needs uh, maintenance and of course the, the human body is no different. Now if I remember uh, if I read this correctly. Uh, you have a, a, an agreement with the NBA where all the new players now have to go through your system. Is that correct? Or all the new drafts going through that? Is or how does that work? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I guess it was five or six years ago now. The NBA of all the leagues we've worked in, uh, I'll give them props for this because you know we've worked in all these sports at the highest level. Mm. Um, the NBA is the most progressive in this space. Right. Uh, they're, they're the most proactive in in uh, in player health. Um, the most proactive in use of technology to benefit the game or benefit the players. Right. And so I think I think this is it was about six years ago, uh, six and a half years ago, the NBA came to us and said they'd followed what we were doing and and they wanted to get out ahead of the sports science uh, space. And so uh, we launched this project with them that is the the biggest league wide uh, sports science venture that that I've ever heard of, uh, where we assess every player that comes in the league now in a partnership wow. with the league. Amazing. And we and we look for a risk of injury and to what body part uh, uh, in these players uh, before they enter the league, and we share that data with the with the players, uh, so it can't be used against them. It's not shared with the teams; it's just direct, shared with the players directly. All right. Okay. I was just going to ask that. You know, how much of that data is in the in the end of the day public or or goes out, and therefore it can really be used for drafts or not, or this is really just stay with the player. Yeah, so this this is in your uh, anticipating an area that's a super slippery slope in yeah. uh, in our, you know, if you're collecting data that uh, is predictive of injury risk or is predictive of performance advantages or disadvantages, then uh, it can be used for the player. It could equally be used against the player, right? Correct. And and so in the case with the NBA, uh, the league did something really smart. Like I said, instead of instead of we assess players before the NBA draft. At their at their combine, but instead of sharing it with the teams like they do, their vertical jump or um, the amount of weight that they can, uh, how many times they can they can bench press 185 sure. pounds, and, yep. you know some of the performance testing. Instead of instead of sharing it with all the teams and letting the teams use that and and mm. deciding who they want to draft, uh, instead we just give it to the players, oh. and and then encourage the players to share it with their teams after they're drafted. So you know okay. a kid that has a a big mechanical issue, maybe has a, a compensation pattern from an old injury that puts him at really high risk for a future injury. Um, that player can get some insight into why his mechanics put him at risk from our assessment, and they can share it with their college, with their college strength coach or their, their their medical staff. And then when they get drafted into the NBA, um, you know, presumably a couple months after we assess them. Then they can share it with the team that drafted them, and we encourage them to do that, but we don't make them do that. And so gotcha. we're trying to we're trying to put the power in the in, in the NBA again to their credit. Uh, we try to put the player uh, in a position of power with respect to this insightful data on their bodies. Now, now in Lucas' uh, example, if, if I remember, he sort of he came to you right when he was young, um, and he did it obviously then uh, on a regular basis. So. Um, did it eventually help him to actually then land, uh, you know, the, the 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 job, so to speak, within the NBA? Or um, so, if you are a young, you know, up and coming, talented athlete somewhere in the world, uh, is it something which you on your own should, you know, call you up and say, "Doc, I need, to, you know, I'd love to do this," and because I want to yeah. have a career? How does it work? Listen, I, my favorite thing we do, and I, I told you this is this is the only thing in, I've, that I've done in my life. This is the only you know the only thing I have any expertise in is this space we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, my favorite thing to do is work with young, motivated, talented athletes and guide them through a long career. And we have athletes that are uh, in the NBA. One of the first uh, that we've had for 18 or 19 years now. I was going to say well. um, um, uh, one of the first NBA players we took in was a guy named uh, Kyle Korver, who was. Uh, Uh, expected to just have a few years in the NBA, and I think he's on he's on either a 17th or 18th year right now, wow. and uh, is the only person left in his draft class except for LeBron James, mm. and and um, and so 
every getting these guys when they're young and healthy, ambitious and young and healthy before things are broken is right. amazing. And yeah. being able to have like uh, Marcus to, to have uh, data context over a longitudinal base instead of just a single snapshot in time is incredible. Um, I can imagine. It, it allows us to see with um, such precision how their bodies are changing. You know, if they have a if they have an ankle sprain, they come back from it. We can tell if they have new compensation patterns. We can tell if anything is is changed to create more risk in another part of their body, which which is something that happens to athletes all the time. Yes. And and then you put a program in place to to neutralize that, to fix it before their their adverse adverse events. And so, really, my favorite thing to do is 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 work with these athletes when their system works pretty well. It still needs to be revved up, but they don't have big injuries that we have to train around, that we have to work around, that we have to try to retrofit. Um, and then have this longitudinal data that's always working for them, that's always in their corner, that can help guide them, that can every year put their bodies back together, to back to a neutral place, so they, they, they enter the season uh, as risk-free as possible. Mm. That's really that's my yeah, favorite one that. we do. I want to take the conversation just a little bit to, into a different area, um, and let's say, let's throw some comparison out. Right? We all read about Michael Phelps and the amazing, you know, wingspan he has, and and, and his, you know, uh, legs uh, were just perfect for that. You have Mike, you know, Usain Bolt, who is supposed to have this amazing uh, athletic ability, and that's why he, you know, outruns everyone. Um, so in the, in some of those scenarios, I would argue it's. Maybe there is some obvious um, biomechanics there which makes these athletes better than others. How much can that be tested as well where you're saying, wow, this, will, this could be the next Michael Phelps or, or Usain Bolt? Um, is that possible already? Yeah. So, look, in every one of these sports, there are um, sort of crux physical systems that allow you to compete or out-compete. Um, and more and more, we're able to start looking for those systems, assess those systems. Mm -hmm. And it, it used to be that, you know, you just all, pretty much all scouting was based on based on performance. You know, if you were a, if you were a swimmer, um, how you, how you were projected was based on the numbers you put up uh, in the previous years. Right. Um, but now we can start looking more granularly. We start looking at the systems that are that that underlie those those numbers. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's just such a better view, you know, so often. So, for instance, um, we have a project uh, with a few NBA teams that is about identifying players that have um, the ability to be amazing uh, uh, NBA defenders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oftentimes, these players weren't defenders in college. Oftentimes, they weren't big defenders in, in high school. Why? Because they were scoring 40 points a game. Because in high school they they had the rock and their job was to score because they could score, right. but they have they have these systems that underpin elite defensive athleticism that have never been shown, mm -hmm. but we can we can test them and we can see that there are the underpinnings of an elite perimeter defender in those systems, and right. there are things there are things like how much horizontal force they can create you know how much how hard can they push against the ground in the lateral plane. Um, their deceleration ability, kind of getting at the James Harden thing, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's these type of systems that we can we can characterize, and so it allows us to it allows us to see what players can be um, based on these underpinning systems, even if they haven't demonstrated those systems in the past. Uh, have you done some work with, let's say, you know, someone like a Phelps who you know is considered one of the you know greatest swimmers ever lived, um, or or Bolt? Um, where you can sort of, in hindsight, say, look, he already had an amazing career, and now study his body and study some of the mechanics. A have you gone there yet, or, or it's more focused really on, on the future? Yeah, you're a, you're a smart guy. So <laughs> um, a lot of, because there's no literature in this space, mm. um, so much of what we do is, is working in whiteboard space. So, so you end up um, reverse engineering a lot of these systems. You know, when we find an athlete that's so far superior with respect to something in sport, anything, even a small yep. piece of sport, um, and we have a chance to characterize his system, to study his, his mechanics, put him, get him in a, in a lab environment and really characterize him, hmm. um, we get taught uh, by the athlete uh, as much as we teach the athlete. Right. And that makes, us, that makes us that much smarter for the next athlete that comes along. Right. Um, I would say this, you know, you, you mentioned Michael Phelps the last couple of couple of sentences and um, in those sports where watch is involved that's sort of the opposite of what I was talking about uh, in the skill development sports 
Um, in the skill development sports, um, like I said, there's lots of slack in the physical development. And I came from I came from uh, working in Olympic sports before I worked with uh, with the Patriots. Before mm-hmm. I finished medical school, I was I was working in Olympic sports. Actually, with swimmers. With his, my oh. first job was assessing swimmers up at there at our in, at the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, okay. in, in Colorado Springs. Interesting. And um, and we would what here's what we would do is we would we would collect things like we'd look at hormone levels. We'd give them uh, power assessments. Do wind gate tests. We we basically put them through this testing protocol. And we generate uh, four or five pages of data, and we sit down with the athlete or the athlete and our coach and show them all this testing. And uh, the athlete would oftentimes say, wow, I had no idea. Mm. And um, they'd think that we were smart, and we'd feel smart. And I thought I had my dream job already at you know, 18, 19 <laughs> years old. And, um, uh, and then I realized that the athlete would then go back to doing exactly what they did before they came up to see us. Nice. And so... We were we were irrelevant, Marcus. We were like we were working hard and we were feeling smart and we were looking smart, but we weren't we weren't changing outcomes. Right. You know, we weren't getting anything done, and so uh, that's what I didn't want to do. I'm very greedy. I want to have information that gives us insight that we can act on now to make lives better. Mm. You know, and that's always our call when we assess an athlete, when we collect some some data on them. It, it's always how are we going to make his life better with this. How are we going to improve his career productivity, reduce his risk from this, this data we just pulled off? And so I think some of these some of these early experiences of working in sports science and, like I said, feeling smart and thinking I had a great job but not doing anything effective, those have really sculpted me. Those have sculpted me. You know, right. I, the, the last thing I want to do is be irrelevant. Otherwise, I go, you know, I go be a neurosurgeon or something like that. So, <laughs> um, so. You know, those sports, uh, the swimming sports, less slack in the system. Those guys are much more optimized. And right. by the way, they've actually had better um, and more practical, even though, you know, I'm giving you examples of it not being uh, very functional. Some of the data we're collecting or how we applied it wasn't functional. Um, um, those athletes in the Olympic sports generally have been uh, cared for better, have uh, more precision brought to their training program than these sports where guys are paid as well as they are. And, Really? In uh, soccer, football, baseball, basketball—that's hard to appreciate. People, you know, that the certainly the fan wouldn't know that that was the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is. It really is, and it is because of what I said before: is that if you're in a skill-dependent sport, you can become less powerful. You can be slower off the ground in a jump shot, but if you're making your jump shots, you're an effective player. Yeah. You know, and you still have a career. So yeah. we work with track athletes, Marcus. And, uh, you know, a number of the better track athletes in the world. And these guys, if we can give them 1%, that was a good effort. It's so hard to make these guys better. We can look for small areas, you know, small, small imbalances or excessive rotation across a joint, things like that. Mm. They're working at 98% of what they can be generally, you know, right, the, okay. the, the guys that are at the peak of their career. Right. Um, we get an NBA player that walks in that is uh, working above 85% or so of what he could be physically, right. then we're always surprised. Wow. And, and that's even more so in, in uh, uh, European football. Yeah, I was just going to come there. I, I wanted to talk some football here, real football. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, let's go. Um, well, and, 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 you know, there are two parts to it. Really. One is, of course, I, I know you, uh, it, I think you publicly announced that, or, or mentioned that you were working with the German national team, which, of course, is very dear to my heart and, and uh, love to hear a bit about what you're doing there. But to start off with, I want to again look at this. Um, let's use some players. You know, we have Cristiano Ronaldo here, who is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a super athlete, right? I mean, if you look at his his physique, and then you have, uh, you know, Lionel Messi, which uh, looks a bit the opposite, right? <laughs> but they're equally unbelievable players, um, you know. And we can debate all the um, who's the better one. But uh, you know, how does you know when you look at football um, again, where do you start, um, and, and what is it really what you guys are looking for to uh, to help each of these individual athletes? with their unique skills and abilities yeah so let's start from the big picture okay the big picture is um, um, the off-pitch development of football athletes has lagged behind the development the off-court the off-field development mm-hmm. of US, US pro sports right. and I'm, I'm saying this with conviction okay right. and I can tell you that I'm, I'm not alone when I told people uh, in uh, in elite football this uh, the smart ones they almost all good they almost all agree 
mm. that this is this is an area that the slack is going to start coming out of this uh, this optimization as athletes of these of these football players. Um, listen, Cristiano Ronaldo, great athlete. I think an optimized athlete, very gifted from just a pure physical specimen perspective, very gifted and probably fairly optimized. Um, and then and then on top of that, incredible. You can't play that game if you're not incredibly skilled. Yep. But you can play that game if you're not physically optimized. Mm. You can you can make decisions quicker. You know, you can be softer on the ball, but you make better decisions. You see opportunities. You've got beautiful touch. You can play the game. Um, the future is having amazing skills and being physically optimized. Right. The future is building athletes that are closer to Ronaldo. Um, and I can tell you when we get, and you know, we started doing more and more in, in world football, and part of our interest in pushing into it is because I think there's, there's so much slack there. I think there's, there are big advantages to be had in development in, in that sport. Mm. Um, and, and, and we can get into reasons that, that, it, that it lags be, behind the, be, besides the fact that it's such a skill-based sport. But when we get an athlete uh, that comes over from Barcelona and we also assess a young college football player, the football player system will run laps around the, the American football player system will run laps around the European football player system. Right. I'm just telling you, they just will. And part of it is that you have to have the endurance on board to go run 10 kilometers or 12 kilometers if you play European football. And so there's, there's some uh, loss of, necessarily loss of power from that, a little bit. But it doesn't have to be as significant as it is. And, you know, you have to be fit to go run 12 kilometers. But the critical movements in that sport, they happen in tiny fractions of a second. Mm. It's, not diff it's not different than the NBA or than the NFL. There are critical Absolutely. movements where somebody gets a half step and that creates an opportunity. And then two passes later, that's a game-winning goal. And so optimizing these athletes, you know, I, 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 we, we had an initiative. We have, we have a, a partnership with Adidas uh, mm -hmm. where they, they were essentially an outsourced sports science arm for them. So we assess their athletes. Right. And uh, uh, they're interested in us putting labs in uh, their top football properties in uh, four different countries. And yep. one, of them, one of them was Manchester United. And so, so I met okay. with their, their performance director uh, a few years ago. And uh, we showed him what we do. And, uh, you know, he followed some of our stuff. And he was really keen to do this. And, uh, and then I got a call two months later. And uh, his name was Tony uh, Sedgwick, I think. But at any rate, I got a call a couple months later. And uh, he said that, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to put the program on hold because we just hired a manager, uh, Mourinho, who, who doesn't believe in, uh, in science and doesn't believe, oh, in any off, doesn't believe in off-pitch training. Wow. And so, you know, they spent all this time developing a, a, an athlete development program over at Manchester United. And they bring in a manager and he undoes all of it. Wow. Yeah, just like that. Mr. Mourinho. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's it. I mean, to me, listening to you, honestly, uh, the, 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 the movie which Moneyball comes constantly in my mind, uh, even though that's different statistics, which they were obviously using um, to get better. But in my mind, the statistics or the data which you're running it ha could have equally and if maybe not more of the same impact uh, as what, what we all watched in that movie. What, what do you think? I mean, I think it's, it's exactly parallel. Absolutely. I think if we're in this space, though, this this uh, optimization of athletes through better data, better technology, aggressive training, um, we're probably at level two out of five in professional mm. sports. I mean, it's still, you know, we're not we're not even to the midpoint of uh, really optimizing this. Uh, but this That's is true. also the time. This is the time that the early adopters get big advantages. Yes. And I can I can tell you, and you 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 know, you've spent your career around sport. You know this. Uh, It's always the smartest teams, the most successful teams that are working hardest. Yep. Um, you know, it's the best teams, the teams that are playing for championships, uh, whose GM isn't isn't going to the championship uh, series because he's got young players that he's trying to trying to work and getting in a great development program, or he's working on uh, other deals, other trade deals. I mean, yep. it's always the best. And so, what happens? Uh, is that this stuff doesn't get distributed equally. It's almost, it's almost all the best teams. It's the Patriots and the San Antonio Spurs and you know, the, the best and most successful organizations that, that, that use this stuff uh, early on. Mm. And that, that's, yep. that's kind of where we're at in, uh, mm. in sports science. 
I can see that. And, and like I said, if, if I be anyone who either owns a team or is in charge of, of a team, whether it's a, a national team like Germany, uh, I would definitely give you a call, uh, Doctor. This is amazing. Um, now, b before we sort of slowly get into the sort of, uh, later part of our conversation here, um, how does that all relate to the average uh, you know, uh, weekend warrior? Hey, Marcus, let me cut you off, too, and, and give you this. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a phone. Please, um, please. I, the, the German national team? I really I like their organization. Those are <laughs> they are they are great executors. Uh, Oliver Bierhoff, you know the yes. the, the boss, yep. smart guy, innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know if there if there's a limiting factor, it's that they're uh, they're a little conservative. <laughs> you know <laughs> they uh, they're they're kind of they have to slice five times uh, yep. before they cut, uh, yep. and it's it's hard to be very innovative when. When that's your process, uh, but they're really they're that's a really solid organization. I've been around a lot of really good organizations, and they have a, they have a very good organization. And I I, I I can't imagine them not being in the conversation as a, as one of the best clubs in the world for a long time because they they're also thinking about tomorrow. You know, yes. it's not just today. They're they're making plans to be good tomorrow. So that's right. We need to win that fifth fifth uh, star yeah. there on our chest. <laughs> yes, I like it. And hopefully you're part of that. So that'd be uh, that'd be amazing. I like it. Um, and I know your wife is German too, so uh, so I think you'll you'll get a couple of extra bonus points there as well if you do that. It would be that would be the only <laughs> bonus points I've ever had because my <laughs> wife doesn't care. She meets uh, Hussein Bolt or Chris Paul or you know any of the athletes we had through, uh, but uh, the German national team. That means something to her. There we go. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah, that means something. <laughs> Now, I was going to ask earlier is, um, you know, we're all, I'm a weekend warrior, right? I've played sports my whole life, and on the back of it, my knees are hurting and, and a few other things. Um, all these great things you're doing, how does that, you know, the same way Formula One, you know, what they're doing at that level, it actually does trigger into, you know, the road cars. Um, how can you yeah. turn that same, you know, if we use that analogy, how, how does it work? And I know you work with some companies from Beachbody and, and others who maybe some of that falls into there. Maybe talk us a bit through that. Yeah. So in the same way that these learnings we have from, uh, say, the NBA uh, translate to a large degree to a sport like uh, world football, mm. um, the, you know, we can generalize a lot of these insights across uh, different types of athletes, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, in that same way, a lot of these insights that we have about how uh, movement affects risk, about how we can predict that uh, the medial aspect of a left knee on an NBA player is going to wear out if he keeps doing this. Um, yep. We all have the same systems. Right. You know, it's going to be generalizable to the civilian, to the non-professional athlete. And I can tell you that, like, especially, like, all of our stuff works. Like, you know, our, the business is, is, you know, more successful than I could have predicted it would, it would ever be. And, uh, and we have more opportunities than we could ever follow. Um, but at some point, we have to take this information and we have to make it available for you and I. We have to make yep. it available not just to the genetic lottery winners, but to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think there people will be hungry for this stuff. Yes. I mean, don't you want to know? Don't you want to know that you're going to wear out your left hip or your right knee um, a decade before you do it, or two decades before, and put things in place? Yes. And um, and so that's you know that's really the that's the future in this space. And I I can tell you it's re it's been really interesting over the last really over the last three or four years, but but. Um, um, academic medicine is suddenly really interested in our space, mm -hmm. and I've, I've, you know, I, I was given this uh, the sports medicine award from Harvard, but but also, you know, some of the other bigger academic med medicine centers in the in the world have reached out and have offered me professorships or want to collaborate with us, because what we do with how we care for, say, your body, is we just tell you to do what you like to do until you can't do it anymore, mm -hmm. and then you go then you go see an orthopedic surgeon. And he tells you whether or not you're a surgical candidate. And that's a terrible model. Yes. You shouldn't do what you like to do and wear out parts of your body or break parts of your body and then go see somebody. Correct. Because these things, these things, Marcus, they telegraph themselves. You know, yes. we, we study these things in elite sport. Um, and one of the advantages is these guys are so hard on their bodies that they wear their bodies out over, uh, over the course of a few years instead of the course of a few decades. Yep. Um, but but the same principles are at play, you know. You have you have an unstable left hip, and you have big rotation across your left knee, and your femur is is flying inward every time you land and try to brace. Mm. Your knee will not hold up. That knee will wear out. It's just it's simple physics. There's too much friction across that mm. 
looked at the contact surface. And so if we can detect these things in, in elite athletes and we can change outcomes, then we have to lever this to help uh, non-professional athletes. Right. And, so and how, and how does it work? Is there already a system where the, if you're a chiropractor or someone who's in, in a general sense maybe in a similar space and he sees you know the weekend warriors and, and helps fix their knees, um, how can he work with you or, or, or maybe some of your companies you're working uh, you, you are in touch with? Um, is there you know is is there already that or is is that coming maybe in the future? Yeah. So right right now mostly you rely on some um, on some unicorn out there you know that has really good. Uh, subjective assessment skills. Mm -hmm. That's mostly what you're left to. And we, you know, some of these bigger ventures, like, you know, I engaged with, you mentioned Beachbody, these guys make P90X and Insanity. They, they make the most popular uh, home exercise programs and have, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 million people doing their programs. Like a lot of people do their programs. Yep. And, and and we did that. Um, I did that partially to help them build better programs because it was a way to scale some of these insights. But um, But also with the interest in, being able to collect the same type of data across big, big data sets, instead of uh, looking at a uh, thousand NBA players, eight hundred NBA players, or a few thousand uh, uh, professional soccer players, to be able to look at these data sets on hundreds of thousands of humans. Mm. And you know, it has to because we're dealing with physics. You know, these are this is simple Newtonian physics. It's really not that complicated. And what happens is, if you collect the data, you look at, you study movement, and you correlate risk you can learn a whole lot. We're dealing with physics. It's not like it's not like we're dealing with chemical reactions where you have these intermediates that are only available to be studied for tiny, tiny fractions of a second. Yeah. Um, it's, it's nothing that complex. Like a lot of a lot of stuff that we've done in medicine, this is high school physics yeah. applied to optimizing bodies. Right. And, and yeah, I, I think it's all about prevention, right? I mean, that's really the, the key well, word here, right? Um, yep, seeing what's, what you will happen if you don't do it differently, right? Yep. It's about prevention, and and I'm, I have a lot of confidence that um, that in the future we're going to look back on this time, and we're going to think that it was just ridiculous that we waited for everybody to just kind of wear out their body parts, and then try to do something about it, replace a joint, or have a have a surgery. Um, right. I think we'll we'll look back on this period and think it was it was a pretty pretty ridiculous time, and we'll we'll do that when we have these dashboard boards that are giving us this insight that we have for professional athletes, so that you know mm -hmm. your left hip is unstable and your femur rotates this much every time you brace it. And after training, now it, now it only, your femur only rotates um, um, uh, half the degrees it did before your training. And, and you want to get it down to another half again to be safe because then you'll be below the mean. Um, so those are, you know, you should have that option. You should yes. have that dashboard. And, and technology is helping us here and we're, we're following this really closely, but this isn't, that's not far in the future, that's really, today and tomorrow it's not uh you know we're not talking 10 years from now yeah i, I can see that and, and I, I think you meant used the word earlier machine learning of course ai uh, i think is going to be huge in this space um huge. and also like you said potentially is that the opportunity is really to bring it to the masses rather than just the elite athletes who whether it's the organization they work for or, or they play for who can afford taking them to you um, or they themselves see the opportunity but uh, you know that's not not every and not all of us can come to your facilities obviously um, but you know how so for how you spread this uh, and therefore take it to the masses I think it'd be a really unique and interesting opportunity there yeah Marcus when we talk about this we actually had a we had a project to build out the Microsoft Connect which is a it's a video game mm -hmm. uh, that uses the infrared depth sensor, and it, it's a, it's the same. It's an infrared depth sensor that we were using in a uh, in a pilot to study biomechanics uh, that was uh, that was that was made by this Israeli company, and we got it we got it actually working really well in a really cheap mobile form, um, and so uh, essentially we we programmed over what Microsoft had built, so we had this this biomechanical assessment tool instead of a video game, and um, interesting. And it, it was really close to being something that we we did deals with Nike and with Adidas, and uh, and it was one step from being something that we'd put out in the world. But then uh, Microsoft stopped supporting it, right. and so I'm looking for the, the that opportunity. I want to I want to have the right hardware on board, and there's a few different candidates. But I think I think it's going to come. It's actually just going to come from computer vision, from video based. Um, 3D interpretation, which is which is really close to being there, and there's a bunch of groups working on it. But we should be able to assess you using your iPhone and compare you to this normative database 
and tell you right now that the biggest risk in your body is your left knee, and this right. is what you can do to re reduce that risk. Like we have, we have, we have the knowledge and the, the hardware exists. Um, we just have to; it has to be built. Yeah, exactly. At the end of the day, it's all about the data, right? And it, it, since you have now a, a strong base for it, and now you can start comparing it and, and running the models, I, I can easily see that. Uh, now that leads us in a, in a sort of maybe to the f last part here, really, um, what I call our cool down part. Um, you know, we've now the, the world of sports has been on a break, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and, and now they all these athletes are coming back. Um, and I already read a couple of articles that you know the the uh, injury rates are just shooting up through the roof uh, because they obviously haven't trained well or, or you know maybe coming out a bit cold. What is it? Is anything you could share or or, or t you know a few words you had on you know what leagues and or teams and or the athlete themselves should be doing um, to get you know to to prevent that? Yeah. So so, I mean. First off, let's uh, let's hope and pray that uh, that elite sport hopes uh, starts up here soon. I, I yes. think that it's going to be. I honestly think, with respect to coronavirus, it's going to be. Uh, it's not going to be episode free, but I don't think there'll be any really bad sidesteps here. I don't think that it's, it's something we wish we hadn't done after we do it. And and it also, let me just say, especially over here in the states, I don't know if you felt it um, uh, over in Asia, but. Here in the States, when the NBA decided to uh, to cancel their season or at least postpone their season when they stopped play, mm -hmm. that was that was really um, when the uh, when the shoe dropped over here. That's when everyone said, "Whoa, this is really serious." Right. And and I think it's in, in times like this that it, it reminds you that um, that sport isn't just a bunch of um, overpaid. 20 year olds that were given too much athletic talent out there um, um, you know just uh, playing a game that mm -hmm. it that it actually has these deep meanings to your society mm -hmm. there are deep meanings in society and so sports starting up the Bundesliga is starting you know first and second yes. Bundesliga, Bundesliga teams the NBA is going to start here probably in uh, July um, yeah. that's 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 really a benchmark for um, society starting up and so I'm, I'm super keen to see this happen um, I'm worried about injuries. I mean, you're, you're spot on. I, I predicted it. I tried not to do uh, take many public stances on it because I didn't want to. I didn't want to like shame teams for to make them look dumb. Um, mm -hmm. But we knew there'd be a lot of injuries. These guys yeah. didn't have enough preparation coming back to uh, uh, to European football. Um, I'm worried about the NBA. Like I said, they're smart. They're giving them a long time to ramp into it. Mm -hmm. But these guys, these guys are going to go from what is essentially an off season now, and a yeah. lot of the guys are doing way less right now than they were in, they would in a real off season, right. to not just to regular season, but to playoff basketball. Mm. The playoff basketball in the NBA is intense. Yes. You know, their legacy is on the line, and that's going to be it's going to be fascinating. I'm, I'm actually I haven't done this yet, but I'm going to I'm going to offer to uh, to set up a lab uh, over in Orlando where we would assess players and give the teams feedback um, on on their systems before they play no. you know give them like the red red flags on uh, players yeah. and, uh, and let them let them work on some of these things before they get back to full speed that, that um, makes sense yeah because it is it is a super dangerous environment these players have such a rhythm of ramping up into the the biggest games and and the playoffs or or uh, you know the biggest tournaments and and, yes. and they're not getting an opportunity right now and and so that's you know these are highly precise systems and when they uh, when they don't when they don't train for a little while even as short as a couple of weeks their the risk goes way up. So. That's right. That's right. You got to take your Ferrari out of the garage sometimes too. That's the same here. You have to take the Ferrari out. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and, and and I did, and you know, and, and on top of it, I mean, we're joking, but uh, you know, these are highly paid athletes, and therefore their careers, um, whether it's shorter or longer, because of this, um, it, it's huge, right? It's it's a lot of money for the organizations, and of course for the athletes and their families. So, yep. um, all those things are critically important. Now, um, we could could go on and on here. This is I love this conversation. I knew it would be. Uh, I would. Um, if someone wants to reach out to you, is is uh, what's the best way? I found you on LinkedIn, but I'm sure there are maybe better places to to get in touch with you. You know, I think if it's if it's a professional connection, LinkedIn is as good as any. Right. Okay. Uh, perfect. I you know for if people want to take a, a glance at what we do, we don't put a lot of effort into it, but we have a we have a, a Instagram uh, account uh, right. handle is uh, P3 Sports Science. 
Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, because I mean, like I said, if I'm a, I I I will definitely highly recommend anyone uh, in the industry who uh, deals with athletes, whether he runs a team or owns a team or or. Uh, manages some of that i think uh, things that they need to be looking at they need to be in touch with you um because i do see there's massive opportunities with the data are getting more powerful and of course i'm sure your uh, your ways of assessing those um and therefore leveraging across so many different sports um uh, is limitless i i, I see uh, it, it's very exciting so um Doctor, thank you so much for your time here. Um, uh, this was fantastic. As I said, we'll, we'll, I'm sure can talk some more. Um, I look forward to seeing the results on my German football team here <laughs> and winning another yeah. World Cup title very soon on the back of all that. I'd like that. I, I would feel very good about that, and my wife would feel even better. Yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, hey, thank thanks, you so Mark. much. You you have a great day there in California, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up again one of those days. I'd love to see your facilities and, and maybe run my own little test there one of these days. That'd be fun. Listen, you you have an uh, open invitation to visit us here or in Atlanta, and uh, maybe we'll collaborate on something over there in Asia. Maybe Definitely. like the, you know, we'll, we'll pick and choose. But uh, but I, I like to win when we do it. So you got to have the right. You have to deal yourself the right hand you have to have the right group to work with but uh i'd be Absolutely. keen to, to to go do something smart with you over there yes i have a couple of ideas already on, on uh, where i'd like you to, to put you in touch with so uh we'll, we can have that as a, a offline conversation here but uh thank you very much perfect thanks so much thank marcus you. you take care be safe definitely The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.